Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the SWAT's NBA Wednesday. Got a bunch of games on the board. Let's get into it. Welcome to the SWAT's. The SWAT's. SWAT's. Hey, get the SWAT's. First up, we got Indiana on the road at Detroit. Pistons are catching four and a half points at home. Total sitting at 233 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet, and according to the model, we're looking at 115.1 to 111.0 in favor of Indiana. So let's get into this one, and we'll start with the Pacers' depth chart. Pretty much running back the same unit they came with last year, and why would they change anything? They went to the Eastern Conference Finals. Obviously, having a healthy Matherin certainly helps. Uh, so we're looking at pretty much the same look Indiana Pacers as last year. Can't say the same for Detroit. They improved a lot in terms of scoring. Tobias Harris is now in the starting five. Malik Beasley, Tim Hardaway Jr., a couple of nice scores in that second unit. Pistons definitely upgraded offensively, and shit, they needed it. <laughs> Last year, they were 27th in the NBA in terms of offensive efficiency compared to second for Indiana. The problem is, what did Detroit do to improve defensively? They brought in some pieces that can score, but... This defense last year was every bit as bad as the offense. So maybe the new coach, obviously Bickerstaff is now coaching the Pistons. Maybe he's able to improve their defense. He, he built some really nice looking defenses out there in Cleveland. So maybe the new coach improves the defense. Um, as far as how they match up against Indiana, they actually did a decent job in transition last year. Eighth in the NBA in terms of limiting fast break opportunities. So that's solid against a Pacers team that loves to run the floor. Problem is they couldn't protect the rim last year 25th in defensive efficiency at the basket 22nd in the paint this is a pacers team that loves to attack the basket 32 percent of their shots from last season they came at the rim so i i just don't think they have the horses to keep the pacers from getting points at the basket and this is a team that detroit definitely struggled with last year the pacers were 4-0 straight up 4-0 against the spread in their four matchups against the pistons last season average cover margin of six so they were covering with ease uh, so I don't see any reason to try to go quote unquote sharp and take the Pistons here. I'm a little worried about the Pacers defensively. The new pieces for Detroit might be able to score some points. So maybe Pacers team total over Pacers minus four and a half. As of right now, I don't have a bet down in this one next game. Milwaukee on the road in Philadelphia. Sixers are catching three and a half points at home now due to the injury news, which we'll talk about in a second. It was at minus two and a half total sitting at 224 and a half. Take a look at the spreadsheet, and according to the data, 112.0 to 103.4 in favor of Philadelphia, but my model includes last 10 days, and the Bucks were so injured down the stretch. We shouldn't really even look at the model until two, three weeks into the season, but um, the template for these videos is set up to have the model first, so there it is. Obviously, the lead story of this game is injuries, right? I mean, mostly on the other side, not this side, uh, but we'll start by taking a look at the Milwaukee depth chart. Some new pieces here. For the Bucks, Gary Trent Jr. is going to be in the starting five. Torian Prince is added along with Delon Wright. Nice defensive piece there. So kind of a new look Bucks here. Got some new pieces in the rotation. Chris Middleton is definitely going to be out to start the year. I'm not sure. I read something saying he was out indefinitely. And then I read something else saying he might not be out that long. So not sure how long he's going to be out, but he's definitely going to be out for this game. Where we really need to look, though, is on this side. The Philadelphia 76ers. Paul George ruled out. Joel Embiid ruled out. And, man, Sixers fans got to be... First of all, your season ends. You lose to the Knicks. It's not just that. But you're coming into this year. Your faith in the team might be dwindling a bit. And now your two star, well, two of your three star players are ruled out for the opener. Definitely doesn't give you a ton of faith. I mean, I wonder how many 76ers fans are like, that's it. I'm not watching the NBA this year. Seriously, all jokes aside, I mean, that's a, that's a terrible look. Um, especially when your guys have struggled with, well, I shouldn't say struggled. Your guys are known for load management and that they're going to miss the opener. Definitely not what you wanted to see if you're a Sixers fan. Um, this is a brand new team, though. Caleb Martin, Paul George, Eric Gordon, Reggie Jackson, Yabusa, Yab, Yabusele, and Andre Drummond. So brand new Sixers rotation here. But as far as this opener with no Embiid, no Paul George, I'm not placing a bet on this. The uh, Sixers were actually covering the number for a little bit without Embiid on the floor. They usually lose, but they have covered. So I'm... This is a straight pass for me. Next game. Next up, Cleveland on the road in Toronto. Raps are catching six and a half or seven points at home here, depending on your sports book. Total sitting at 224 and a half across the board. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, 112.8 to 110.6 in favor of Cleveland. 
So let's look at this matchup, and we're dealing with pretty much the same Cleveland lineup as last year. Max Struess is injured. I think he's going to miss six weeks, I read. I think it was about six weeks. Uh, Sam Merrill listed as questionable. Other than that, we're looking at the same Cleveland Cavs roster that we had last year, obviously with the exception of head coach. Bickerstaff is gone. He's over with the Pistons now. Kenny Atkinson is coaching Cleveland now. But as far as the roster, same unit as last year. Um, they're matched up against Toronto, and they're also pretty much running out the same unit we saw last year. Not really <laughs> the best-looking starting five here, but in terms of depth, I mean, they do have some players. Bruce Bound and, uh, and Walter, their first-round pick, they're both going to start the season injured. But, I mean, they have a rotation. This is a bad basketball team, but it might not be quite as bad as you think because they are kind of deep. Regardless of how deep they may be, though, we can't ignore that this team was just terrible down the stretch. They were 10-32 and 32 after making the Siakam trade. There was a couple weeks there where they were covering numbers, they were being competitive, and we we're like, hey, this, this new Raptors team has some energy. That faded. I mean, this team was terrible down the stretch. Uh, the one thing they could do that was admirable was push the tempo. They were actually second in fast break frequency, second only behind the Pacers. So they did push the tempo. They weren't bad at it. They were 14th in efficiency. They're matched up against Cleveland, who was just okay defending the fast break. So I guess that's something. But I mean, other than a couple of buckets in transition, where are the points coming from here for Toronto? They're matched up against the Cavs, who were elite at protecting the basket and I know they made a change of head coach so we don't really know what to expect here from Cleveland but as long as Evan Mobley and Jared Allen are on the floor you have to think the Cavs are going to have elite rim protection so this Toronto team 32 percent of their shots came at the basket last year they're not going to be able to score like that at the rim against Cleveland and on the other side of the court this was a Raptors defense that really struggled against the three-point shot Cleveland offensively launched a ton of threes last year 43 percent of their shot attempts came from beyond the arc last year and they were pretty efficient shooting the ball they have a lot of shooters there in cleveland so i don't see any reason to try to take the raptors here not comfortable with laying a big number on the road with the brand new head coach i'm not really sure we're looking at cleveland shooting numbers who knows if they're even going to take this many threes now with kenny atkinson um, but one thing i think we can hang our hat on here is cleveland's going to be elite uh on the defensive interior and the raptors are an offense that want to score down there so uh, I took Toronto team total under in this one. Next. Orlando on the road at Miami. The Heat are laying two points at home. Total sitting at 208.5. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we have a very slight lean on the Heat. 107 to 105.7. So model showing us a close game here. Um, as far as the Magic roster, pretty much looking at the same unit as last year, with the exception of Contavious Caldwell-Pope. And if you ask me, that's the perfect addition to this team. I mean, the lack of three-point shooting from Orlando in that Cleveland series uh, in the playoffs last year was appalling. I mean, this is a pretty solid team. They can get to the basket. They can get to the free throw line. They can score on the interior. They can even defend the interior. But in terms of three-point shooting, this was about as bad as it gets in the NBA. So Caldwell-Pope, perfect addition. Edition. They needed a shooter. They added a shooter. Now, does that give them three-point shooting now? Certainly gives them more. Um, they have Gary Harris. He can shoot the outside shot as well. So they got they got what they needed. They needed a shooter. They got a shooter. Uh, on the Miami side, obviously the big draft pick where uh, who knows what he'll be able to give us in the opener right out of the bat, but this is a crazy athlete. The rest of the lineup for the Heat looking exactly the same. Spolstra doing his Spolstra thing where every single player on the team is listed as questionable. Gotta love that. Uh, I'm not betting this game. This is a straight pass for me. Miami owns Orlando, but towards the end of last season, I went pretty heavy on Miami against Orlando, and they lost. And it was like a one, one and a half unit bet for me. I'm still a little frustrated about that. Love the spot. Uh, so, look, I, well, these question marks, uh, this is just a pass for me. Next game. Brooklyn on the road in Atlanta. Hawks are laying seven and a half points at home. Total sitting at 221 and a half, pretty much across the board. Let's take a look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got to lean on the Nets if you're going by the point spread 109.3 107.0 in favor of atlanta take a look at the nets roster they did add bohan bogdanovich but he will not be playing in this game he's been ruled out they're also going to be missing dayron sharp other than that i mean you got cam thomas you got cam johnson finney smith claxton's pretty similar looking nets uh squad here on the other side we got some new faces for atlanta dyson daniels from new orleans larry nance jr is here and then obviously the first overall pick reese shea uh, don't know a ton about him. I've watched his highlights on YouTube. That's about it. Just what I've read. So I don't know how much of an impact he'll make right away. As far as how these two teams match up on the court, 
Uh, well, they were pretty much dead even last year. In overall net efficiency, the Nets were 22nd. The Hawks were 21st. Hawks were better offensively, but the Nets were better defensively. The glaring weak spot of this Atlanta team last year was defending the fast break. They were the worst in the NBA. Dead last in defensive efficiency in transition. The good news for Atlanta... Brooklyn didn't really push the tempo much, just 22nd in fast break frequency. So that could be a positive for the Hawks, and the Nets don't really take advantage of what the Hawks are bad at. But at the same time, you could say the exact same thing on the other side. Nets also struggled defensively in transition, and the Hawks also didn't push the tempo much. So kind of a, a, a one-off there. Kind of tough to predict what we're going to see in these openers. Uh, one thing we do know, though, Atlanta was absolutely terrible at home last year. 15 and 26 against the number at home, 11 and 17 against the number as home favorites, and 0 and 4 against the number against Brooklyn. And this is a Nets team that got off to a red hot start last year. In fact, after 16 games, they were 11 and 5 against the spread. So the Hawks were terrible at home last year. They didn't cover the number once against the Nets. The Nets came out red hot last year. I took the Nets. I got it at plus eight. I mean, I know that's not a ton to go off of, but I mean, it's opening day. There's not going to be many angles here. I, I took Brooklyn at plus eight. I'm in on it. Next game. Charlotte on the road in Houston. We got the Rockets laying seven or seven and a half, depending on your sports book. Total sitting at 229 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a pretty strong lean on Houston here. 115.6 to 106.6 in favor of the Rockets. Let's take a look at the Hornets depth chart. They added Josh Green in from Dallas. Mark Williams is hurt again, uh, which sucks for them. Other than that, a lot of familiar faces here. LaMelo Ball being healthy is the big factor. He missed most of last year with an injury. On the Rockets side, they brought in Steven Adams. Other than that, they're rocking with the same unit here in Houston. And honestly, why would they change a thing? Down the stretch, they were one of the best teams in the NBA. They almost made it all the way to the playoffs. Uh, they started the season 25 and 34, finished the season 16 and 7. They were battling Golden State there for the 10 spot down the stretch. They lost that one game and they put them three games back and it was over. But they were coming up on it. There was a two-week stretch where Houston was realistically in competition for that 10 spot to play in the play-in tournament. So there's a lot of hype coming into this season for Houston. Houston. If we take a look at their overall efficiency numbers from last year, they were the significantly better team. So was everybody. Charlotte was the worst team in the NBA last year. If you go by overall net efficiency, minus 10.6 dead last 28th offensively 29th defensively the thing with this Rockets team that makes it a little tough we saw two halves of the season through the first half they were elite defensively down low protecting the rim and then the second half when they got hot they were beating teams like 137 120 just running them out of the gym so we saw two versions of this Rockets team I think based on the success they probably want to come out looking like that second half version uh, more fast pace, outscoring opponents rather than trying to lock down the uh, interior. One of the strengths of this Houston team last year was defense in transition. One of the best fast break defenses in the NBA. Doesn't really apply here because Charlotte almost never runs the fast break, 27th in frequency. The angle I like most for Houston in this game is their advantage offensively down low. Remember, there's no Mark Williams for Charlotte. So who is keeping the Rockets off the offensive glass? This is a great offensive rebounding team last year. They were eighth in overall offensive rebounding rate last year. And you know what else the Rockets do a lot of? Take shots at the rim. They weren't that efficient with it, but they took a lot of them. 31% of their shot attempts last year came at the basket. Charlotte, terrible defending the rim, mostly because Mark Williams missed a lot of last season, but he's out for this one as well. So Houston should dominate the offensive glass. They should be able to score points at the basket. I just don't have a lot of faith in Charlotte defensively here. And as far as the Hornets trying to score on Houston, I mean, this is a Hornets team that relied on the jump shot a lot. Houston played pretty good defense against jump shooters last year. So I'm just not seeing it here for Charlotte. I think that building's going to be rocking. I think the Rockets fan base truly believe they have a playoff team here. I think they're going to run Charlotte right out of the building. So I like the Rockets to cover. I bet the Rockets at minus seven. I also wouldn't be mad at a Houston team total over, but I think the Rockets cover this one. Next game. Chicago on the road in New Orleans. Pelly's are laying six and a half points at home. Total sitting at 225 and a half, pretty much across the board. Take a look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a slight lean on New Orleans, 112.1, 108.1. So four point edge to the Pelicans, according to the model. Let's take a look at the Bulls depth chart. And it may not look like they added a lot of pieces, but this is kind of a new look lineup just based off the injuries. Patrick Williams, now he's questionable. So we don't know if he's gonna be back for the opener, but he missed basically all of last year. Zach Levine missed basically all of last year. Lonzo Ball hasn't played in a decade, it feels like. Josh 
Giddy is a new piece, and so is Jalen Smith. But the point I'm making is this Bulls team, they lost to Rosen, and people are looking like, Josh Giddy, that's it to replace DeRozan? This is going to be a bad Bulls team. And they're not really taking into consideration all the pieces they're getting back from injury. This is a pretty solid looking depth chart. I mean, look at the guards. Giddy, Kobe White, Lonzo Ball, Dasunmu. That's solid guards. That's four solid guards. I mean, who knows what kind of production you're going to get from Jalen Smith. He's all right. Patrick Williams, if he's able to stay healthy, that's a great piece. I don't think this Bulls team is in that bad of shape. I think they're being undervalued a bit. That being said, they're going to have their hands full on the road in New Orleans. This team is supposed to be very, very good. This is a good team. Last year, they added DeJounte Murray at the one. So as far as a starting five, goes you're not gonna find many teams with more talent than these guys right here that being said i'm a little worried about the depth for new orleans i mean trey murphy's hurt you got alvarado he's solid javante green probably gonna see serious minutes other than that you got me uh from i think he's from baylor who knows what kind of product he's 20 years old who knows what kind of production you're gonna get out of him out of the gate so i gotta say i am a little worried about the depth here for new orleans and they're playing a bulls team that happens to be pretty deep so there's no way I'd lay here, but I'm not going to take the points either. I would lean towards Bulls plus seven or plus six and a half, but I didn't personally bet this one. Next, Memphis on the road in Utah. The Jazz are catching three points at home. Total sitting at 227 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. According to the model, we got a lean on the Jazz. Uh, model is taking into consideration numbers from last year, and Memphis was riddled with injuries last year. Um, but according to the model, 110.3, 109.0 in favor of Utah. So yeah. If you look at the numbers from last year, Utah was the better team. I mean, in terms of overall net efficiency, Utah was 23rd, Memphis was 26th. So Utah was the better team last year. But we know the Memphis team we're going to see this year looks nothing like the Memphis team we saw last year. I mean, John Moran obviously back. Marcus Smart, Desmond Bain both missed some time. Jaron Jackson Jr. is going to miss the opener. Uh, in fact, that's a little disappointing if you're Memphis. You still are dealing with injuries. After the season you had last year, All if I'm a Memphis Grizzlies fan, the only thing I would want this season is to come out with a healthy lineup and they don't have that Jaron Jackson Jr. is going to miss the opener Luke Kennard is going to miss a week or two Vince Williams Jr. I read could miss three weeks don't quote me on that um, so some of the key pieces for this Memphis team still out that being said with Morant Marcus Martin Desmond Bain that's a pretty serious one two three right there Zach Eady starting at the five <laughs> I'm not really sure what kind of production we're going to get out of him I personally didn't think he was an NBA guy so we'll see how he looks they're going on the road to play this Utah Jazz team that really isn't bad looking at all keep in mind the Jazz also were dealing with injuries last year they brought in Patty Mills and then Cody Will uh, Cody Williams in the draft you got Keontae George, Colin Sexton, marketing. I mean, this isn't a bad team. Specifically, they're excellent on the offensive glass. We'll get to that in a second. As far as matching these two teams up on the court, my biggest question is right here because Utah's glaring weakness last year, well, they had two, defending the fast break and defending the three-point shot. If you go by last year's numbers, the Grizzlies took a ton of three-point shots. I mean, 43% of their shots came from beyond the arc last year. But the thing is, with John Morant on the floor, this is a much different Grizzlies offense. And some of the guys that were taking all the threes last year for Memphis, Luke Kennard, Vince Williams, I mean, they're both hurt. So with John Morant, going to have a high usage rate, going to have the ball in his hands a lot. I don't know if we're going to see the same volume of three-point shooting here from Memphis, even though it is the weakness of the Utah defense, or it was last year, I should say. The other weakness of this Jazz defense, like I said, is the fast break. They were terrible defending the fast break, but if you go by last year's numbers, Memphis didn't push the tempo much. I'm thinking they probably will a bit more with John Morant on the floor, um, so I'm thinking the, uh, Memphis should be able to exploit this, but we'll have to wait and see. It is the opener. But what concerns me most for Memphis is right here. Jazz were an excellent offensive rebounding team last year. They were actually second best in the NBA, second only behind the Knicks. 32.5% offensive rebounding rate. Memphis was already a team that struggled on the defensive glass, and they're coming into this one on the road without Jaron Jackson Jr., their best interior presence. And the Jazz have all of their bigs healthy. Marketing, Taylor Hendricks, John Collins, Walker Kessler, they're all healthy, which was not really the case for a lot of last year. So Utah might be even a better offensive rebounding team this year than they were last year. This team was also great at home, 24 and 17 against the number at home that was fifth best in the NBA. I think they're gonna dominate the offensive glass in this game, which is why the only way I'd go here is to take the plus three with the Jazz. I haven't yet because that Memphis team can be really, really good when Morant's on the floor, but I would imagine Grizzlies minus two and a half, Grizzlies minus three is going to be one of the more, if not the most public bet on the board. 
So if you're the type of person that likes to fade the public and play those super sharp spots, Jazz plus three, Jazz money line might be worth a look. So I haven't bet this one yet. I'll let you know if I do. We'll talk about it on the live show. As of right now, Jazz plus three or pass. Next game. Next up, we got Phoenix on the road in LA to play the Clips. Clippers catching four and a half points at home. Total sitting at 224 or 223 and a half, depending on your sports book. Take a look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a close one here. 108.1 for Phoenix, 107.5 for the clips uh, obviously this is another game where injuries are the lead story but we'll start on the phoenix side some new pieces added to this sun's team a couple of point guards actually ties jones and monte morris which is a little weird because booker beal durant i mean they could all be the primary ball handlers if you needed them to but i guess they want them playing a little more time spend a little more time off the ball they also added mason plumley uh, but really we're talking about the inactives on well inactive period on the Clipper side. Kawhi Leonard out indefinitely, as I'm sure you've heard if you had Twitter. Obviously, Paul George is no longer there either. He's with Philadelphia, uh, which makes me really want to bet the Suns here. But the problem is, if you followed along with me last year, you know that the Suns were the death of me last year. I had a great NBA season last year, but the Suns betting on them or against them, I just couldn't figure the Suns out. So there's no chance in hell I'm about to lay points on the road with the Suns. I don't even want to touch a Suns game for at least two or three. <laughs> Let's get some data points in. This I could not get the Suns right last year, so I'm not going to be betting this one. On paper, with the missing pieces, the Suns should be the significantly better team here. But the Clippers, I mean, even in games when Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard was out, even in games when Paul George was out, they were competitive. So... I don't know. This is just going to be a pass. I guess Suns are... Nah, just pass. Last game up, we got Golden State on the road in Portland. Blazers catching six points at home. Total sitting at 222, pretty much across the board. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got Golden State by five and a half, six here. So pretty much right on point with where the sports books have it. 110.6 to 105.2 in favor of the dubs. So let's get into this one. Obviously, Golden State was the much stronger team last year. You don't need me to tell you that. 13th in overall net efficiency compared to 28th for Portland. As far as offseason changes, I kind of like this new look Golden State team. Obviously, they lost Klay Thompson, a key part of the team for the last decade, right? I like the addition of Kyle Anderson. I think that gives Golden State exactly what they needed. Kyle Anderson can, can facilitate with that second unit. He plays defense. I think it was exactly what they needed. Also, DeAnthony Melton, Buddy Heald, a couple of shooters off the bench. So, I mean, look, Clay Thompson is not the player he once was, but he was a key part of the team chemistry-wise. So I'm sure losing him will hurt in some capacity, but... I like the way this new look Golden Warriors team is shaping up. I do. They're matched up against Portland in this one. And in my opinion, we just don't know what we have here with the Blazers because there were flashes of when they were healthy, they looked pretty good, especially defensively on the perimeter. Problem is we didn't see them healthy much last year. I mean, they got Simon, Scoot Henderson, Shadon Sharp. They got some talent there in the backcourt, but none of those guys could stay healthy. And we're starting off the same. I mean, Shadon Sharp's not going to play in this game. Uh, Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simons are both healthy, though. I suppose that's a start. Um, and having them both healthy is significant here because if you remember the brief stints where we saw Portland's backcourt healthy, they were very good defensively against the three-point shot. They actually finished the season in first in defensive efficiency against the above-the-break three-point shot. In case you don't watch Golden State Warriors basketball, it's almost all they shoot. Only the Celtics take more above-the-break three-point shots than Golden State. 35% of their shot attempts come from that zone. Portland, when they have their pieces out there, play great defense on the perimeter. They force turnovers. They put a lot of pressure on shooters. So this is not a great matchup for Golden State. Also, what is Portland's weakness defensively? The fast break. They cannot defend in transition. At least they couldn't last year. Golden State doesn't push the tempo at all. In fact, they're 29th in fast break frequency. I mean, they were last year, I should say. So Golden State may not be equipped to take advantage of the weakness of Portland's defense. So right now you might be thinking, all right, let's take Portland. Let's take the six points. Let's take the money line. It's a great matchup for the Blazers defense. Here's why I can't do that. I don't know where the points are coming from. The only thing Portland did decent at all last year was offensive rebounding. They were third in offensive rebounding rate. It was basically the only redeeming quality from the Blazers' offense last year, their ability to get offensive rebounds. They couldn't do anything else. Golden State defensively was a solid rebounding team last year, and I just can't count on the Blazers to hit shots to cover this number, so I cannot take Portland plus six. What I can do, I haven't bet this one yet, but I'm kind of talking myself into it, I can take the under 
222 and a half. I like the under in this one. Give me the under. Live show, 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll go through every single game on the board. I'll bring on a couple guests. If you want to see every bet I personally have open, head over to kylecrims.com and click on open bets. You'll see all mine as well as everyone else on the staff here. Also, if you sign up to Sauce Network Plus, it comes with access to the Discord and you can participate in the weekly betting league. $150 in one of these trophies go to the winner every single week. So if you're interested, head over to the website and sign up. Let's have ourselves a great NBA Wednesday here. Please remember to bet responsibly, especially right now. It's so early in the season. So please bet responsibly. Talk to you later.